Um, I want to begin with a topic that, that is occupying an enormous amount of the conversation here, but also your work and the work of U.S. intelligence agencies, and that's uh, the Russia's invasion uh, of Ukraine. If I could begin with, with, with a general question, mm. who is winning? Right. Well, uh, before I come on to, mm -hmm. to, that, to that question, first of all, I mean, I'm delighted to be here. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's tremendous. It's lovely to be back uh, stateside. I uh, spent some of my teenage years in Chicago. My yeah. first uh, paid employment was as a beach attendant on Lake Michigan. Uh, and, uh, and I went to two of uh, your fine universities. It's absolutely mm -hmm. wonderful to see uh, a gentleman over there, uh, Joe Nye, who I was a teaching assistant for mm -hmm. in 1986. Uh, so it's lovely to be here and great to be at Aston where all of these uh, issues are being talked mm -hmm. uh, about by this amazing group of people. Um, on Ukraine, what would I, you know, what I say, one has to start by just reflecting on the fact that this is the most egregious naked act of aggression uh, that we've seen in Europe since the Second mm -hmm. World War. Uh, and that you cannot condemn it too much. And we're seeing played out uh, on our TV screens on a, on a daily basis, just the true horrors of that mm -hmm. war that are being visited on the Ukrainian people. I think in order to answer your question, I think you have to go back and think through what were Putin's war aims. And I can think of three principal ones that he had going into this. And we had the uh, enormous privilege, the US and UK intelligence uh, services of, of knowing what his plan was. And he had three things he wanted. One was to remove uh, Zelensky. Mm -hmm. Second uh, was to capture Kyiv. Uh, and second was to uh, sow disunity within the NATO alliance. Mm -hmm. And if you turn to those three briefly, um, President Zelensky is still very much there and has proved to be a fantastically su successful uh, leader of his people in their resistance to uh, invasion. So I think that's a, that's a fail. Mm -hmm. um, if you, uh, they completely uh, failed to capture Kyiv and uh, received a very, very bloody nose uh, doing it. They continue to suffer badly uh, on, on the uh, battlefield. 15,000 uh, Russians have lost yeah. their lives. That's probably a conservative estimate. That is uh, the same number, roughly, as they lost in 10 years in Afghanistan mm -hmm. in the 1980s. And these, these, these are not middle-class kids from St. Petersburg yeah. or Moscow. These are poor kids from uh, rural parts of Russia. They're from blue-collar towns in Siberia. They are disproportionately from ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, these are his cannon fodder. Yeah. Uh, and so we're still seeing that play out. And then thirdly, um, on uh, NATO, NATO has proved extraordinarily united in the face of this. Uh, and there are sort of tectonic plates shifting in European security. Uh, the change of, European, of uh, German defense and security policy, overturning decades yeah. of an approach, astonishing thing. And then Sweden and Finland in the alliance. I never thought I would see uh, Sweden and Finland yeah. join NATO. Sweden's just given up 200 years of neutrality to do that. So on all of those, I think they count as epic fails. So I think he has suffered a strategic failure in uh, in Ukraine. It's obviously not over. He's obviously made, and the Russian forces have made some incremental pro progress over recent uh, weeks and months, but you ha it's tiny amounts, and mm -hmm. we're talking about a small number of miles of advance, and when they take a town, there's nothing left of it, Jim. Yeah. I mean, it is obliterated. It's so, uh, and I think they're about to run out of steam. I think our assessment is that the Russians will increasingly find it difficult to supply manpower, materiel, over the next few weeks, mm -hmm. they will have to pause in some way. Uh, and that will give the Ukrainians opportunities to strike back. Uh, their morale is still high. They're starting to receive increasing uh, amounts of good weaponry. Why are the next few weeks and months particularly critical for Ukraine to maintain the, that position? Uh, I think that it's important, I think, to the Ukrainians themselves that they demonstrate uh, their ability to strike back. And I think that will be very important for uh, their continuing high morale. I also think, to be honest, uh, it will be an important uh, reminder to uh, the, the rest of Europe um, that this is a winnable uh, campaign by the Ukrainians, because we are about to go into a pretty 
uh, tough winter. And to, mm -hmm. you know, to, to want to sound like a, a, a character from Game of Thrones, but yep. winter is coming, yep. and clearly, uh, in that um, atmosphere, with the sort of pressure on gas supplies and all the rest, we're, we're in for a tough time. Your American counterpart made something of a headline here yesterday by saying that, that it's the U.S. intelligence, and, and given the Five Eyes agreement, I have to imagine you have a similar assessment, uh, that, that Putin is not ill, despite a lot of uh, rumors and, and speculation. I wonder if you share that assessment, but also more importantly, do you know, right? Do U.S., U.K. intelligence agencies have sufficient penetration of Putin's inner circle to know the truth, not just of his health, but of his thinking? But Jim, you, you won't be surprised to hear me say that I, I won't sort of, I won't go too far into mm -hmm. what sort of coverage we have around Putin's circle. But uh, there's no evidence that uh, Putin is uh, is suffering from serious ill health. Do you know his intentions? Do you have sufficient understanding? Uh, the, the U.S. lost a, 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 which we reported at the time, a, a tremendous source inside his inner circle. Um, what is the state of of the West? Well, let's just say the Five Eyes vision. Uh, to understanding Kremlin's plans and, and uh, desires? Well, it's a very, very important part of what we, uh, what we do. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, unusually, the world got um, more of an insight into that than they normally do mm -hmm. uh, because of the uh, decision to declassify some of the intelligence which was uh, showing us the plans mm -hmm. that Putin had for his invasion. So, you know, by the very mm -hmm. fact that yeah. that stuff was out there, it gives you yeah. some sense that we have an ability um, to uh, monitor some of what's going on uh, around him. Um, and we, by the way, you know, that, that declassification is something which uh, we do it very carefully because uh, for us in particular, I mean, I run a human intelligence uh, uh, service, and for us, the uh, secret agents who, who decide to throw in their lot with us and help us, uh, we have a sacred trust to protect them. So we are not going to reveal and declassify intelligence if it's going to lead yeah. to their uh, uncovering. And that was very much uh, uh, in our minds as we move forward with that declassification. I, I want to ask you about it, human intel because I know this is, you're still a true believer even in the age of, of advancing technology. But, but before we get there, mm. uh, U.S., U.K. intel got a lot right about this uh, uh, invasion, even in the face of, uh, of a lot of doubts from, from Europeans and, and even Ukrainians, at least in their public statements to the days prior to the invasion. How do you rate the performance of Russian intelligence in, in the lead-up to this war and since then? Well, uh, thank you. I did, uh, we did get some stuff right, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was faced with some uh, skepticism at the time. But I sort of understand that. I mean, partly because when you, when you share intelligence, uh, you, you don't go into the inner workings of this. So, you know, inevitably you're faced with a bit of uh, kind of doubting Thomas uh, um, behaviors as people don't fully understand how, on what basis you are, you are, you are uh, saying that you know this is going to happen. But it did allow people, I think, to prepare. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did allow us, I think, to completely defeat the sort of false narratives that uh, Putin was putting around his invasion. Um, if I reflect on our uh, Russian counterparts, I mean, I, like the Russian military, I don't think they're having a great war. Um, they clearly completely misunderstood uh, Ukrainian nationalism. They completely underestimated the degree of resistance uh, that the Russian military would face. And it was a sort of, I think as far as I can tell, a sort of toxic combination of them not really getting their intelligence right, but also, mm -hmm. uh, Intelligence services reflect the, the societies mm -hmm. they serve. Now, I am answerable to uh, democratically elected ministers. I'm answerable to parliamentarians. I'm answerable to judges over certain aspects of my work. It's a rather different system uh, in Russia. And one thing that uh, it doesn't pay is to speak truth to power. So I suspect some of the kind of reality of what they were about to encounter was just not being briefed up mm. uh, to Putin. And subsequent to uh, this invasion, we, we've taken some pretty concerted effort against them. So across Europe, uh, roughly half, uh, at last count, something north of 400 Russian intelligence uh, officers operating under diplomatic cover mm -hmm. have been expelled. Mm -hmm. And we, we reckon in the UK that's probably reduced their ability to uh, do their business to spy for Russia in Europe by half. And we've also uh, seen a number of um, uh, illegals 
You know, some of you may have seen the uh, rather good TV series, The Americans. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, it's slightly less glam glamorous, I think, mm -hmm. if you're a real Russian illegal. And two of them have been arrested recently, one of them uh, masquerading as a Spanish journalist. A chap called uh, Gonzalez uh, Yage has been uh, arrested uh, in Poland. He was trying to go in uh, to Ukraine to be part of uh, their destabilizing efforts there. Uh, and another chap, uh, Chekhov, has just been uh, jailed for uh, 15 years in, in Holland. So you, you stick around doing not a lot as an illegal for quite a long time mm -hmm. with all the stresses, uh, and then you turn up and try and do a job, and you and you get end up with 15 years yeah. in, in jail. So that, that's one side of, of, of human uh, intel, counterintel. In general terms, let me ask about the other side. As Russia has been cut off from the world, in, in effect, uh, and, and there are a lot of Russians who are not happy with that, whether in business or perhaps in government as well. Has this been a target-rich environment for recruiting potential assets? I don't think I'm going to go there on that one. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I very much um, hope that uh, Russians, uh, many of whom will be within those intelligence services, within their diplomatic service, elsewhere in uh, positions of uh, influence inside Russia will reflect on what they are witnessing uh, in the Ukraine. Mm. And if I think back um, to the impact, for example, that the crushing of the Prague Spring had in 1968, that was a moment when a number of Russians decided that, uh, or oh, Soviets in those mm -hmm. days, uh, decided that it was their time to try and uh, strike back against the system that they were representing. So uh, we'll have to see, Jim. That sounds like a pitch to me. Uh, I, I, our door is always open. Okay. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about China, if yeah. we can. Uh, you have been very public about uh, the growing uh, threat from China. You, you said in November the Chinese Communist Party leadership increasingly favor bold and decisive action justified on national security grounds. The days of Deng Xiaoping's hide your strength, bide your time are long over. The, the Ukraine invasion, by the way, this was, this was a process underway prior before the Ukraine invasion led many to, to finally reappraise Putin and Russia. Uh, there are many who still, up until February 23rd, right, thought mm -hmm. this is someone they could work with, and, and many, not all, have changed. As you look at China and, and Xi's statements and, and things like stifling of Hong Kong or the incarceration of Uyghurs in Xinjiang and other steps, are you reappraising China as, 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 a, as a, not just a competitor, but an adversary, a greater threat? MI6 has never had any illusions whatsoever about uh, uh, communist China. Um, so I, I think there has been um, uh, a growing recognition right across government and our societies mm -hmm. of some of the threats that the Chinese pose to our societies. And I thought that the Director General of uh, MI5 and the Director of uh, the FBI, who spoke in London a few days ago, did a pretty good job of, of laying out why Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't be naive about yeah. what the Chinese are trying to do to our societies. Uh, so w that has been the case with us for, for some years. What is different, undoubtedly, Jim, is that we have putting more effort uh, into China. Uh, we now devote more effort to China than any other single subject. So for example, it has just moved past uh, counterterrorism in terms of our mission. And that feels like a very big uh, moment, post 9-11, post 7-7 in London. Uh, but it reflects uh, the seriousness of the mission for us. And this is right across the piece. It's about, if you like, in my case, getting upstream against some of the threats that they pose. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, even where one wants to engage from a position of strength with China, whether you're trading with them or whether you're trying to find some common ground on climate change, et cetera, uh, this is still a pretty um, opaque system. Mm -hmm. I mean, at one level, uh, understanding Xi Jinping's strategic intent is not difficult. If you, if you read uh, you know, Chi Made in China 2025, he lays out for you their ambitions around technology and their desire to dominate mm -hmm. uh, key technologies. But if you go beneath that strategy in terms of how they implement, how they organize, how they, you know, what their tactical intent is, and then what are the capabilities they're building up, 
that's a black box. And uh, there's a role for organizations like mine in helping British ministers and policymakers to understand that so they can navigate this really complex, difficult relationship uh, with the Chinese. They're very public, as you say, about their ambitions. They're also very public about their perception of, of American and Western weakness. I, I wonder, does China, do you think, today look at the West's response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine as a cautionary tale for any designs they might have on invading Taiwan? I think it's um, too early to tell what lessons they will draw from Putin's misadventures in, in Ukraine. I think there is uh, lots of signs of them really going into overdrive, trying to work out what they think about this. Uh, as always with the Chinese system, uh, that is mixed in with a sort of ideological overlay uh, that they're trying desperately to draw the right lessons which would be approved of by President Xi as they go into a party congress. So it's, it's quite difficult to read at the moment, but I am very uh, clear, and this is one of the reasons why it is so essential that we tough it out on Ukraine and we keep going through this winter and we help the Ukrainians to, uh, to, to, uh, to win, uh, at least negotiate from a position of uh, significant strength. It's because uh, Xi Jinping is watching this like a hawk. Mm. And as you say, he's got a very entrenched narrative of Western weakness. Mm. I said in, in a previous uh, speech that I worry about that because I think he underestimates mm. US resolve and power. And that might lead him to miscalculate over uh, the sort of issues that we've been talking about over the last couple of days, particularly over Taiwan. James Stavridis, who's a frequent participant in, the, uh, in this conference, wrote a book uh, last year called 2034, which is a novel but envisions a war between the US and China. And he's, he's told me and probably others in this audience that when he goes to the Pentagon, folks will say to him, the only thing you got wrong in that book was the date, 2034. We think war might come earlier. And you, you've heard this from Admiral Davidson, for instance, talking about the possibility in public comments uh, of military conflict between the US and China. Do you believe that war between, and when I say US, I say really the US and its allies mm -hmm. uh, in China, Britain included, is war inevitable? I don't think it's inevitable at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's still very much, uh, I think, the desire of all of us to see the differences between uh, the peoples on either side of the Taiwan Strait settled in through peaceful means. That's what we would all aspire to do. But uh, coming back to those lessons from uh, Ukraine, uh, and lessons from other uh, aspects of uh, Western behavior. It is really important um, that President Xi, uh, as he calculates what he may or may not do on Taiwan, I think looks at uh, what can go wrong with a misjudged invasion. Uh, mm. And we're seeing that played out. And I think it's important that we remind him of those risks. Uh, it's important that uh, we prepare accordingly. I don't think it's inevitable at all, but, but um, clearly we need to find ways of uh, messaging with clarity mm -hmm. and, uh, and getting the sort of deterrence uh, in place that's necessary to avoid that type of miscalculation. So in the age of high technology in so many fronts, including facial recognition, a whole host of things that make human intelligence, humans, so much harder, uh, and enormous tools, and you know what satellites can see and sense mm -hmm. from far away, and, 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 and electronic surveillance, et cetera. Why do you still believe that human spies work and they're essential, and how can they operate? Because I see uh, on a daily basis, I mean, that's, that's my background. I'm a mm -hmm. case officer by background. You'd expect me to believe in, sure. uh, in what I've always done. And, um, and we continue to uh, recruit and run uh, incredibly brave uh, men and women who help us. And uh, we will always uh, continue to do that. And of course, yes. Uh, the technology arrayed against us is uh, more sophisticated mm -hmm. uh, and is, uh, means that we have to, you know, we have to uh, develop and adapt at the pace of that technological change. And uh, there's no doubt about that. That's a big challenge. But we find ways of doing it. We will continue to find ways of doing it. One of the ways we will do that is by um, partnering in a very different way with tech and with industry to help us with the mm -hmm. technology we need yeah. to, to hide and get on and do our business. But uh, so far, so good. Jim. Broader picture in technology, you, you speak very often about this, about the, uh, the, the new sort of fields of competition uh, going forward, whether it's quantum computing, uh, that, that, that these are areas where, where the UK, the US, its partners have to really up their game, right, mm -hmm. right, to compete. And as you know, there's a great deal of nervousness in the West that we are losing 
this, right? We're losing to China on, on quantum computing and, and, and other things. I wonder, in your view, is the West losing that battle, holding its own, or winning the battle today as it stands, or don't we know? I, I, think, we're, I think we're definitely in a battle. We're mm -hmm. in a competition, but I'm really confident we can win because we have advantages that the Ch Chinese simply don't. Mm -hmm. And that's about having free societies, having an ability to think uh, freely in, uh, in our universities and to innovate. And the UK has got an extraordinary S&T uh, pedigree. Um, I have extraordinary technologists in my own organization. So I'm very confident we can win, but we do have to get ourselves very organized in that competition in technology. And we also have got to get, the other thing about winning in this uh, competition is that we have, um, if you like, uh, something to offer the middle ground of countries. You know, there are a lot mm. of countries out there mm. that may not share um, our values, they may not share our political systems, but they are a vital battleground for us uh, as we seek to, to compete with the Chinese. And if we leave a vacuum in those uh, places, the Chinese will fill it. Um, and I, you know, I look at this again, I fall back on, I guess, on, on being a case officer and being an intelligence officer. When I, when I go in and, and try and forge a relationship with uh, the service of a country that might fall into that category, you know, I'm looking for common ground. Mm. Uh, I, I know they may have different, but I'm not leaving, I'm not leaving my values at the door, by the way. I'm, I'm, you know, I have to stay within UK law and, and my values are, are critical to my service. But they may not share them. I will find ways of finding a common ground. And I think we've got to do that. And part of that is frankly, uh, not seeing this as some kind of set of a 1950s cowboy movie. Mm. With all, you know, the bad guys have uh, black hats and we all have white hats. Uh, it, it's a messy, contested world out there and we've got to be prepared, I think, um, to, to mix it uh, in that space as yeah. well as in the technology arena. Great hats. I mean, you, you speak about this theme often, the ambiguity inherent in relationships, that, that there are folks that you, you, you got to deal with folks in the middle. I wonder if you could give us an example of that, of where that's working, and do you consider resurrecting potentially the Iran nuclear deal as an example of that, given the partners involved, right? Because it's not just Iran, but, but I mean, Russia and China were, were parties to that deal prior. I mean, on the, uh, on the Iran deal, uh, I continue to believe that for all of the limitations of the, of the nuclear deal of the JCPOA, it's mm -hmm. probably, if we can get a deal, it's probably the best means still available to constrain the uh, Iranian nuclear program. I'm not convinced we're going to get there, and it could be a bit academic having that discussion, because I don't think the supreme leader of Iran uh, wants to cut a deal. So uh, uh, Iranians yeah. won't want to end the talks either, mm. so uh, that they could run on for a bit, and if the Iranians drop some of their preconditions, there's a deal ready and waiting for them. But I think you know, there is a connection between, and even if we do the deal, by the way, there's still plenty of work for my service yeah. to do uh, because of what they're up to in terms of destabilizing activity around their region, what they're doing in Iraq, in Syria, mm -hmm. uh, even down uh, in the Yemen through their sponsoring of the Houthis. So there's plenty to do, and they're still assassinating or attempting to uh, entrap uh, dissidents yeah. overseas as well. So plenty to do. But it, it, it's to my point about the middle ground, you know, that our partners in that space may not all uh, share our values, but we have got to work with our friends in the Gulf uh, in order to enhance their security. Some of the progress they've made in recent years uh, in terms of opening up their relationships with Israel is deeply welcome, uh, and I, help, I think that helps and uh, strengthens that partnership. But that's a good example of where we need to engage with these sort of countries. You, you sound skeptical, though, that there's a, a path forward for the Iran nuclear deal. I, I'm skeptical that the supreme leader will go for the deal. I think mm -hmm. the deal is absolutely on the table, and uh, the European powers and the, uh, and the administration here are very, are very clear on that. And I, I don't think that the Chinese and Russians on this issue uh, would block it. Um, but I don't think the Iranians want it. You have spent a lot of time here in the U.S., as you say, as, as, as a young man. You, you were a lifeguard. You went to two... Uh, I wasn't a lifeguard. I didn't have the body oh, for that. I was, I was a beach attendant. Ah, oh, beach attendant. <laughs> It's a big difference. See, I, I, you know, I was puffing you up there, but... Yeah. Uh, well, literally, I... Uh, you went to two prestigious U.S. universities. You have come away as a fan of the Cubs and the Bears, as I understand it. Absolutely. And you're choosing this forum for your first interview, mm. public interview outside uh, of the U.K. Clearly, you have 
admiration for the U.S. and you spent a lot of, a lot of time here. Do, do you look to this country ever with some concern about the state of our politics, the, the, the state of uh, I mean, violence in this country, uh, the state of its climate commitments? As someone who spent a good deal of time here, do you look across the pond and say, I'm worried? So I come out and do these things uh, publicly, as we discussed earlier on, because I think in the 21st century, I've got to come out and talk a bit about my service and what we do. Although, mm -hmm. as you've discovered, Jim, there are constraints around Understood. that. I'll still keep but, pushing. <laughs> yeah, thank you. But it's, uh, it's important, I think, for, for renewing our license to operate in a democratic society. Doing it in the US just gives me an opportunity to, to recognize the extraordinary partnership we have with the US intelligence community, and particularly with CIA. We've been together with CIA for all 75 years of their history. Uh, and that partnership, I'm proud to say, keeps the citizens of both our countries safe and helps promote our interests and values overseas. Now, more broadly, as I look on America, I think this is the joy of the sort of... Pro I was lucky enough I got a thing called a Kennedy Scholarship when mm. President Kennedy died. Mm. There was a public subscription in the United Kingdom, and the money went towards a set of scholarships every year. And uh, I was a lucky enough recipient of that. And the brilliant thing about these programs, the brilliant thing about the fact that Joe came over as a, a Rhodes Scholar to the United Kingdom, is that you learn about the society warts and all. Mm. You know, you don't, you know, you, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to um, give my views on US society here in front of a camera, but of course I have views. But I, I, it starts from a position of huge affection for this country and a huge admiration for what it's capable of doing. Uh, and, you know, I sit, you know, this phrase, uh, special relationship, is, is, is bandied around a lot, yep. uh, and people are sometimes angst about it. Uh, all I can say is the bit that I am lucky enough to look after and, and curate uh, for five years is the most special of all elements of that relationship. It is an extraordinarily intimate, high-trust relationship. We share uh, our most intimate secrets with one another, uh, and that keeps our two countries safe. Uh, it was part of Boris Johnson's, well, to that point. Boris Johnson's parting words the other day included that, keep, keep, whoever follows him, keep that relationship with the U.S. close. I'm going to ask this in a, in a slightly different way, if, if, if you'll uh, indulge me. On this stage, I think it was five or six years ago, I asked DNI Clapper, who had the opportunity to speak to him, and I asked him if he ever applied, you know, as a decades-long intelligence officer, much like yourself, if he ever applied his services stability tests on the U.S., to look at the U.S., not just, you know, not look, look afar, but in, to, to, to look for trend lines on political instability and, 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 and others that, that might concern him. And, and he answered, he said, yes, I do, and, and I see some trend lines. I can't remember the quote exactly, but I, he said at the time, perhaps presciently, that, that he sees trend lines on political division, uh, eroding confidence in institutions across the board that worry him. And I, I think in retrospect, those comments were prescient. So in that way, mm. do you ever apply MI6's <coughs> stability tests or paradigms on the US? Well, I have a great advantage over uh -huh. a CIA in that I have no analytical function. Uh -huh. So I don't need to do that uh, at one level. Um, look, of course, the, the health of uh, the society you represent, the uh, economic strength of that society, all of that parlays into one's influence overseas, and, and that mm. includes uh, the Secret Intelligence Service. So, of course, it counts. Um, but one of the joys of our system to use, I think the Aspen Institute describes itself as resolutely nonpartisan. Mm. Um, and that is one of the great things about uh, my service is that uh, we are above uh, the fray, we have a job to do uh, for Queen and country, and uh, we get on and do it. Mm. And uh, uh, the UK has been through a uh, you know, pretty turbulent time in its history over the last few years, but that has not affected the work of the service. And, and frankly, it hasn't affected the sort of partnerships we've had with the United States, but of course, uh, with many of our European partners. I mean, it's fantastic to have, uh, I can't spot him here, but he'll be somewhere around, uh, Mick Moran, who's the uh, head of the Estonian service, who are a brilliant service. I mean, gosh, pound for pound, probably knock us into a cocked hat. Uh, fantastic uh, <laughs> uh, uh, service. Um, so all of those partnerships are in very good order, and uh, we crack on. Uh, MI6 deals with the world as it is, not as we would want it to be. Uh, so we're pretty pragmatic, and we get on and do our job. 
You, you uh, frequently identify four big threats as the principal threats, uh, Russia, China, Iran. We, we've dealt with those, the fourth being international terrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, we're coming up on the one-year anniversary, which is, uh, I almost can't believe, it, it doesn't seem like it's been that long, but uh, of the Afghan withdrawal. Uh, how, in the view of MI6, can you credibly and sufficiently monitor and disrupt international terror, terrorist groups in Afghanistan from the outside in, as you say, or over the horizon, as U.S. intelligence services say? Can you? Well, uh, as I uh, just said to you, MI6 deals with the world as it is, yeah. not how we would wish it to be, and I'm not going to relitigate decisions uh, uh, around the withdrawal. I'm just curious, uh, are we less safe? Well, uh, I think I said uh, very clearly that this was the reverse for us yeah. uh, when it happened, and it's now more difficult. But. Uh, the fact is that preventing al-Qaeda from regrowing the sort of capability that we saw in the run-in uh, to 9-11, and I was a sort of close-hand witness to that. I was serving in Islamabad in the uh, late 90s when uh, Osama bin Laden moved to Afghanistan. I don't want to go through that again. Mm -hmm. uh, and my service and, of course, uh, our U.S. allies are absolutely determined that it won't. So we'll have to find different ways. And again, it comes back to my point. You, you have to find some middle ground partners in, in that space who you may not normally like to deal with, but you're going to have to in this space uh, because we need, to, we need to find a way to do it. So more, it's more difficult, um, but the uh, importance of that mission hasn't gone away, and we need to execute on it. Understood. Uh, in terms of, I asked you about the performance of the Russian intelligence services as it relates to, to Ukraine. If we could talk about Chinese intelligence services mm. for, for a moment here. The, the U.S. suffered about 10 years ago an enormous loss with, with the loss of many of its, its human sources inside, inside China. Uh, and I, U.S. intelligence officials speak to me very candidly about how much that set them back, right? Um, has that recovered to some degree in terms of the U.S. and U.K. working hand in hand with its partners there. Uh, what is the state of the Five Eyes vision into China today? So the Five Eyes are pretty joined up uh, on China. And of course, one of the Five Eyes, our Australian uh, allies, are, are right under the yeah. cosh at the moment with uh, uh, the Chinese trying to make a, an example of them for them having had the temerity to uh, call for an investigation into the origins of the pandemic. Uh, so we're pretty tight uh, as a group of uh, five nations. In terms of what we're up against in uh, 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 the Chinese intelligence, so, so again, I thought the director of the FBI and, uh, and uh, Ken McCallum, my MI5 colleague, did a pretty good job of laying that out. They are extraordinarily well resourced. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of civilian intelligence officers, let alone uh, their military capability. Um, they are uh, ferociously active right, mm. active right across the cyber domain. And it's not just the pure intelligence service. And we've had a rather celebrated case in, in the UK recently of somebody working on behalf of the United, uh, United Front Workers Department, mm -hmm. which is, is, whose job it is is to try and influence our societies towards a pro-China uh, position. Now, influencing other countries is, you know, I, I, I went and often was a diplomat for a few years. That's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, it's influencing uh, other countries towards your position covertly, yeah. uh, undeclared, using funding uh, that's not on. So there's a lot of that going on. But I would just say that they're not 10 feet tall, these people. Mm. Uh, and they are perfectly possible uh, to work against, and that's what we're determined to do. And, and we have this huge advantage uh, that the Chinese don't. Is we have friends, we have allies, yeah. we have an ability to work uh, in a trusted way uh, to try and take on this challenge. Are Russia and China strategic partners now? For years, the way it was described was that uh, it, it was more of a not quite even a marriage, but a relationship of convenience where, where, where things overlap, they would work together. But, but do you see the two joining forces more, you know, more deeply, but also for the longer term? Right. Well, uh, Presidents uh, Putin and Xi, when they met, they came up with this uh, um, agreement, didn't they, with the term no limits. Now, I can see over your right shoulder that there are limits in terms of the amount of time you're allowed on the stage and so uh, <laughs> uh, things. But that no limits is a ringing phrase, isn't it? That's a ringing phrase. And I think it pays, you know, when President Xi says these things, he means them. Uh, and we ought to listen hard. Mm. So I, I think that relationship is, is very clear. The uh, Chinese are um, helping the Russians over Ukraine by buying their oil. Uh, as Jim, as uh, Bill Burns said yesterday, 
Uh, I think they're being quite conservative about military assistance, yeah. but I'm sure uh, if they could provide that uh, and get away with it, they would. Uh, and on the diplomatic front, I mean, they are right. We witnessed a bit of that yesterday. Uh, they are right on the front foot, um, uh, beating the Russian drum and mm. uh, t selling the uh, Russian narrative around Ukraine and doing it without any sense of irony. This is a country that spends a lot of time banging on about sovereignty and territorial integrity. Here is the most egregious uh, example of someone tearing that up in yeah. Europe, and the Chinese keep on selling their, uh, selling their uh, snake oil around the world. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it feels pretty tight, uh, but it's not an equal partnership, uh, and Ukraine has made it less equal. Um, Moscow is very much the junior partner, and uh, the Chinese are very much in the driving seat. One thing that struck me in covering the run-up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and, and while they're there, and since then, right, it is, and I'm sure many folks in this room too, is just how public U.S. intel services were with what they knew, right? They, they were declassifying a whole host of, of things that quite normally would, would, they would not, right? Or you would have to squeeze, you would have to squeeze mm -hmm. out of them. And, and even here, we're sitting next to you, uh, and you're answering you know, what I hope are hard questions, right, about, about issues that typically intelligence services don't want to talk about. And by the way, you have a Twitter account, right? And you mm -hmm. tweet. Um, is that public face working? Do you see that it worked, for instance, in this conflict, you know, by, by say, exposing Russia's plans for, uh, you know, false flag operations, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Did it work? So, uh, a bit of humility required here, mm -hmm. because uh, what it didn't do was stop the invasion. Uh, Bill Burns traveled to Moscow to, to look Putin in the eye and, well, insofar as you can, down a VTC uh, link uh, and spoke to some of the other seniors and uh, uh, despite laying it out in front of them and warning them of the consequences, they went ahead. But I think it did take away his false narrative from him uh, and that's been really important, I think, in shaping uh, world opinion uh, on this. Um, so it's helpful, but it was done I, I emphasize again, with great care, because our responsibility to our sources, whether they are technical or human, uh, is paramount. Mm. Um, so that was done carefully, but I think it was justified in the circumstances, absolutely. Um, as we uh, come close to, to the end uh, of, of our time here, I always ask, I, I try to ask as often as I can, folks in your position or similar positions, particularly at this time in this country and, and the world, it's, it's a time of genuine challenges and crises, whether it's climate change or a land war in Europe, right? Almost, you know, that we haven't seen on this scale since World War II. We have political division at home. You have, you have, you have the winter is coming, right, phenomenon with perhaps energy shortages in Europe. W what is the most positive development that you're seeing play out on your, on the things that you watch closely from a national security perspective? I mean, I suppose to some degree, NATO standing together yeah. with Ukraine against yeah. Russia. But, but, but give us something that perhaps we're not paying enough attention to on the positive side of the ledger. Don't, don't underestimate that. As I say, this feels mm. like tectonic to me, mm. you know, to see the Germans uh, changing their policy yep. in the way that they are doing to see the Finish. 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 Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's yeah. astonishing. So don't underplay that. And also, you know, let's not overplay uh, the power and the attractiveness of the Chinese model. Uh, there's some pretty interesting uh, news breaking, isn't there, about indebtedness around the Belt and Road Initiative. Yeah. And this is building. Mm. Uh, and uh, Bill Burns talked yesterday about uh, Sri Lanka, another country that's uh, close to my heart. I lived in Sri Lanka yeah. as a kid. A beautiful, beautiful place with so many natural advantages. And uh, the relationship with uh, China, and in particular the sort of elite capture uh, that the Chinese achieved uh, in, in Sri Lanka, and the sort of... Uh, uh, really misplaced economic uh, decisions they've taken, you, you see the results at the moment. And uh, you know, so I think that would be my other th uh, thing here, to say back ourselves, back our model, back our, uh, our freedoms and our ability to think independently and be creative, uh, and make sure that when um, some of that uh, some of those promises are not fulfilled by the Chinese, that we're pretty open about, ex about revealing that and uh, making sure that countries understand the issues. You know, around, I've spoken about uh, uh, data traps as well as debt traps. The data traps are where you, know, you allow people into your critical infrastructure, you allow the Chinese to, to a place where they control a lot of your sovereign data. That creeps up on you.
Mm. And it's really important that, uh, that services like mine help partners to understand those sort of threats. Yeah, it speaks to the broader point, right? Uh, this, uh, imagining either Putin or Xi or Russia or China are 10 feet tall can often be mistaken. And we've, we've seen sure. evidence of that in, sure. in recent months. Absolutely. Uh, Richard Moore, I enjoyed the conversation very much. I hope that you maintain this openness to me and us in the future. We'll take you up on it, and we, we wish your Cubs the, the, the best of success. Thank you very much. As long as they're not playing my Mets. Thank you. Sure.